Well, praise the Lord, my brothers and sisters. Welcome to another Bible study with Sister Denise and Straight Thinking Teaching Ministries. We are rounding out this absolutely awesome book in the Word of God, the book of Leviticus, chapter 27 with vows. And that is so quaint in a time and in the cultural context that we all find ourselves in here in the United States. This book, the book of Leviticus, has had one overarching theme, and that is holiness. Holiness, holiness. <clears throat> And it seems to be that holiness is all but abandoned except by the remnant. When we find that the scripture places emphasis on the holiness of the God we worship, and therefore, he imputes that by way of declaration of righteousness to us, that the expectation is that we be holy. And therefore, he says in Leviticus and also in the book of Peter in the New Testament, be ye holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. So this has been an awesome and a profound book of rediscovery by the people of God. Now we round it out with our vows that we make unto the Lord God apart from the required offerings for sin, for peace, um, for uh, whatever we offer unto God, that on top of that, there is vows that we make and can make to God when we are serious about our walk, relationship, and fellowship with the Lord God. Now, apart from the required offerings, sacrifices for sin, for peace, our burnt offerings, our burnt sacrifices, and then those that are required from the feasts that are called for throughout the year, we can vow, we can make a vow to the Lord. Now we can vow ourselves, children, other people. People can vow themselves for various reasons as we're going to see in chapter 27, but these are voluntary. And so before we get started in the reading, I wanna go through and pull up a PowerPoint slide so that you could see and get a overview of the book before we enter into the reading, because sometimes that does help. So Leviticus chapter 27, I, I named it the Nadar. And the Nadar is the Nadar is the word for vow in the Hebrew. And vows that are made to Christ are expected to be kept, just as they were as the children of Israel were being taught by Moses that they can make vows and how they do that and the context in which they should be done and the parameters in which they are done and are acceptable. You can make a vow but those vows are expected to be kept. 
there are exceptions to that, to one or two. And as we go through the scriptures, we're going to see them. And, but otherwise they are expected to be kept. Vows in the forms of persons, animals, personal property can be made. Vows can be redeemed um, before the Shemitah. Remember the seven of sevens and then that, and that next year, the 50th year, that is the year of Jubilee, what we call Jubilee, uh, but scripture and in the Hebrew language is the Shemitah. And then, but the fee for the redemption of a vow is 20% or the fifth part, as the scripture would say, 20% uh, of the value of that um, vow. And so we learn a lot of how to manage and prioritize a vow and other relationships that are an extension of that vow when we make and manage well our vows that we make to Christ. That is one of the benefits that come out of making a vow. A vow is voluntary. So you enter into a vow under the auspices that this is something that I want to do for the Lord because I just simply love him. And the benefits that come out of that relationship expresses itself in our commitment to other relationships. For example, the relationship in our families, with our spouses, with our children, with our employer, with our neighbors. It has the powerful effect of teaching us to respect and honor those relationships with the same care that we do with that which with the Lord. It also teaches us that we should not make rash vows. And the scripture teaches us from responding rashly to situations, but also from entering into relationships without giving um, thought to what we are getting into. So the vow is a powerful, powerful commitment that the scripture deals with. Notice how every aspect of our life from the scripture is dealt with. Christ has already dealt with that and already given us the instructions on how to proceed. These are selected scriptures that we'll come back to that support vows and our attitude towards them. We're going to come back to those. I just wanted to open up with that uh, section in our PowerPoint slide to teach us and to show us uh, what the context of the scripture, the scripture text that we're going to be reading, what it's about. So. Let's go and let us begin our reading. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When a man shall make a singular vow, the persons shall be for the Lord by thy estimation. Okay? And thy estimation shall be of the male, 20 years old, even unto 60. So from the age of 20 to 60, the estimation of that person or the value of that person shall be 50 shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary. And if it be a female, then that person is gonna be valued at 30 shekels. Now, the reason for the difference, 
is not because a woman is inferior in terms of uh, her comparison to the man. Men are physically and biologically created differently than women. And God deliberately designed it so that the man will be the one to pursue the family and to be responsible for and to work for his family. That's why. Your role, my role as a woman in the family is not diminished. At, absolutely at all. So when you hear these outside voices talking about equality and have taken that to a point where women on every, in every single level have bought into that she is equal to a man falsely um, in a way that God never intended, not for us women. So understand that that is not coming from Christ because there are huge differences between women and men, okay? In this context, it's being valued because you're going to get more out of the man based on his biology in terms of work. That's it. Okay, and that is true today. If the person uh, that is making a vow or is being pledged as a vow from five years old to 20, then the estimation shall be a male 20 shekels for the female 10. From a month old, even to five years old, then the estimation shall be of the male five shekels of silver, female, three shekels of silver. 60 years old and above, the male, 15 shekels, female, 10. But if he be poorer than the estimation, then he shall present himself before the priest. The priest shall value him according to his ability. Let the scripture define what the mind of Christ is saying that vow shall the priest value him. So you mean, okay, we've got these separate groups. What do you mean from age 20 to 60, uh, five to 20, and then um, from a month to five years of age, and then you have your seniors. Some people dedicated themselves and then others, obviously, children were dedicated to the Lord. We have examples of that through the scripture. Um, Samuel, his mom, uh, dedicated him to the Lord. After she weaned him in her gratitude to the Lord. So we have examples of people dedicating their children dedicating themselves to the Lord, uh, whatever their reason is. And the vow, notice that the vow was paid by the one giving the pledge. Notice that. But if he be poor than thy estimation, then he shall present himself before the priest and the priest shall value him according to his ability that vowed shall the priest value him. So the person making the pledge, they pay the value of the vow to the Lord. Now, let's continue to read because now the scripture is going to explain what the mind of Christ has in mind. So that was people. Now, if it be a beast, 
All that any man giveth of such unto the Lord shall be holy. He shall not alter it, nor change it, good for bad or bad for good. And if he shall at all change the beast for beast, then it and the exchange thereof shall be holy. And if it be any unclean beast of which they do not offer sacrifice unto the Lord, then he shall present the beast before the priest. The priest shall value it, whether it be good or bad, as thou value it, who are, who are the priest, so shall it be. But if he will at all redeem it, then he shall add again the fifth part thereunto unto thy estimation. And when a man shall sanctify his house. So now we get into personal property. As we saw in our um, PowerPoint slide, we can uh, bow certain uh, items, things, ourselves, our children, even our homes. Then the priest shall estimate it, whether it be good or bad. As the priest shall estimate it, so shall it stand. And if he that sanctified it will redeem his house, then he shall add the fifth part of the money of thy estimation unto it, and it shall be his. So he's, he or she has dedicated the house to the Lord. It's been valued for the purposes of use into, for the Lord. Like my home is dedicated to the Lord for everything. That's all there is. Therefore, I don't permit certain things in or out of my home because this is the place where I want the peace of God to rest. I want people who visit me or make come and temporarily stay with me, feel the presence of the Lord. But it's all an extension of my life being of committed and placed in, into the hands of God, that which I've committed unto him for him to keep, all of that is a part of that. Under the old covenant, the people of God voluntarily uh, made vows unto the Lord. And, and, and uh, in this case, what we're reading, uh, it's their home. And if they wanted to redeem it, it was gonna be a cost to do that. And if a man shall sanctify unto the Lord part of his field or his possession, then thy estimation shall be according to the seed thereof. A homer of barley seed shall be valued at 50 shekels of silver. And so we measure things in bushels. And so this would have been several bushels. Now, this is an agricultural society. And so the, whatever the field, whatever it was produced, um, whether it was barley, whether it was wheat, whether it was some sort of a fruit, uh, particular to that region, whatever came up that, and if that uh, owner of that field wanted to dedicate a part or all of that field unto the Lord, that person can do that. Now, remember, the culture is an agricultural society, an agrarian society. So the land is vital and what the land was to yield. So it was very important that the people of God understood the various rests of the Lord and that the rest was commanded and expected to uh, have its Sabbath, which they did not keep, of course, uh, however, but nevertheless, if in addition to the tithing of the land, the tithing in all the firstborn that were already committed unto God of the males. In these vows, 
In addition to that, if they wanted to vow the field, just commit the field, all or part of it, or purchase another, they could do that. But the vow, even during the rest, that vow was in place. And so that year of rest for the land that was also uh, a part of that rest, that vow uh, and under that command, that rule, that even though the land was vowed, it was subject to that seven year rest, okay? So understand, today we are in uh, a different kind of economy. It's an economy based on knowledge, technological knowledge, information knowledge. And so as we go out and earn a living, we can vow our time to either our employer or our self-employment, we could dedicate that to the Lord. We can vow that to the Lord. It is voluntary, remember. So this is not a part of the required giving, but if I, in our economy, want to vow my services that I am under contract with my employer, if I want to vow that time and vow that salary to the Lord or a portion of that salary to the Lord, in our economy of information and technology, I can do that. You could do that. It's voluntary. So it's not like there's no application of the principles that are operating here that cannot be applied from the 15th century BC in the, into the 21st century AD, year of our Lord. The principles of the vow are the same. All of my life, aspects of my life, property, family, relationships, I can vow them. I can only be blessed by that. If a man shall sanctify unto the Lord some part of the field of his possession, then thy estimation shall be according to the seed thereof. A homer or barley seed shall be the value, 50 shekels of silver, if he sanctify his field from the year of Jubilee, according to thy estimation, it shall stand. But if he sanctify his field after the Jubilee, then the priest shall reckon or determine unto him the money according to the years that remain of the Jubilee. Because we know that's blocks of 50 years. So if I make a commitment, or a person in this case would have made a, a vow uh, three years into the new uh, 50 year time frame, then the priest would value what that uh, potential plot of land or field would produce for the remaining 47 years and value it based on that and what the market would bear from that time. And if he that sanctified the field will in any wise redeem it, then he shall add the fifth part of the money of thy estimation unto it 
and it shall be assured to him. And if he will not redeem the field, or if he sold the field to another man, it shall not be redeemed anymore. So you have a situation where a person in this time would re, uh, vow, vow, and of a field, part or all of it, and it is vowed and committed to the Lord. But then that person then sells that plot of the land. That new owner cannot redeem that field. It goes into the divine savings account, if you will, until the year of Jubilee or the 50 year, Shemitah, okay? But the field when it goeth out in Jubilee shall be holy unto the Lord as a field devoted. The possessions thereof shall be the priests. And if a man sanctify unto the Lord a field which he hath bought, which is not of the fields of his possession, that is, he goes out and he finds another plot of land somewhere else, not that which he uh, has inherited from his forefathers or her forefathers, okay? But sees some land, wants it, goes out and purchases it, okay? That's what's being talked about here. Then the priest shall reckon unto him the worth of the estimation, even unto the year of Jubilee. And he shall give thine estimation in that day as a holy thing unto the Lord. In the year of Jubilee, the field shall return unto him of whom it was bought, even to whom the possession of the land did belong. Wow. And all thy estimations shall be according to the shekel of the sanctuary. 20 geras shall be the shekel. Now, what is that? What does that mean? Well, that's kind of difficult to give a value on the shekel or and the gera only simply because of this. Our measurement of these um, elements vary over millennia. And so you would have to know what the value of the shekel was at that time converted to the gera, its equivalent, and then you'd have that value. So even today, for example, silver, if I were to convert the shekel into the value of a silver today, well, that what is the going price? What would it sell for today versus three days ago or two days ago? It's, it would be different. So the value of that would fluctuate. So you, you really can't put a, a dollar value in our currency today and, and hold to it because you can't, okay? The value of what it would go for in that day and its equivalent in Gera and then translate into uh, the dollar, well, how would you do that? So you can exercise for a mathematical mental exercise. You can go in and toy with those over time and play with those, but it's not something that you could argue with any strength because the values certainly are not the same. Only the firstling of the beast, which should, which should be the Lord's firstling, no man shall sanctify it. In other words, that which already belongs to God up front, the first of all the males and the first of all the animals, you, they're already the Lord's, so you can't make a vow or they were not permitted to make a vow of such things because they already belong to the Lord. But there was so much disobedience among the people of God then as there is today that that's exactly what these 
uh, people who were redeemed so graciously, they did it anyway. Um, oftentimes trying to be uh, for appearances sake and to appear unto men that they were giving something more than what they were required to give. And people do that today. Notwithstanding, no devoted thing that a man shall devote unto the Lord of all that he hath, both man and beast, and of the field of his possession, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy unto the Lord. Now, that word devoted should be understood differently from a vow because a vow is devoted. But everything that's devoted, you know, uh, is not a vow. Okay? So we need to make that under the nadar. That which is a vow may or may not be devoted. The thing that is de devoted is a special classification of a thing or a person that belongs to God and it may or may not be uh, dedicated for destruction. Vows generally are not dedicated for destruction. They are in a particular uh, divine savings account, if you will, for a particular period of time until what is called the Jubilee in our language. But then all of that goes back to the original owner in the Jubilee. And only those things that were eligible for redemption could be, rede could be redeemed, but redeemed at a price. The devoted or thing that is specifically categorized as committed, set aside a special, you can even call it a special sanctification, sanctified thing for either destruction or for the Lord could not be redeemed and nor could it be vowed. And if it was devoted or dedicated for the purposes of being destruct, destroyed for destruction as in the Babylonian garments and the things when they went into Jericho, those items were dedicated to destruction. So the plunder for them, they already belong to God. The people of God were not supposed to take those. That's another example. Those things that are set and scheduled for destruction, another example would be that individual who dishonored his parents. That individual was subject to death. That was not a redeemable, uh, devoted thing. And to teach the lesson to all of us that the Lord expects and commands us to honor our father and our mother in the kingdom of God. So that which was devoted and dedicated and and um, intended for destruction exclusively for the Lord could not be redeemed. And whatever the purpose and intention, it was expected to be carried out. None devoted which shall be devoted of men shall be redeemed, but shall surely be put to death. So understand the context, what that means. So that disobedient and rebellious child who would not listen and who was we were told and they were told an instruction to stone that child then that was supposed to be carried out that child couldn't be redeemed nor that person 
who dishonored his father and mother could be redeemed or any other person that were dedicated, such as when God commanded King Saul, I want you to destroy every body, leave none out. He didn't do it. So those if are to be put to death, they ought to be put to death for the purposes of God. And I want to add and interject here. I make no apologies for the Lord God giving his people instruction to destroy the children, the male, the female. I make no apologies for that. I don't know the mind of Christ. I'm not a God and neither are you. Even though you put yourself in a position to call into your court the Lord Jesus Christ for what he commanded in these old covenant um, wars when his people were replacing the inhabitants of those lands. You don't know how God dealt with these people and the patience of God with these people in their uh, sin. So I make no apologies. He is correcting and he is judging sin. And if you don't like it, well, you take that matter up with him. And then have the nerve to say and to call into question, well, if he's a loving God, why would he do this? Why does he allow evil? Study the word of God, honestly, if you can. Because once you do that on your own, you will see the long suffering of God with mankind. And you would repent from your wicked deeds and words and blasphemies. All the tithe of the land, whether of seed of the land or the fruit of the tree is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. So notice that the tithing is not the vow, okay? The tithing is separate from the vow. And whether we tithe something today separate from a vow that we may make unto the Lord that is entirely up to you. But the tithing can't be vowed because the tithing already belongs to the Lord. And if a man will at all redeem any of his tithe, he shall add the 20% to that. And concerning the tithe of the herd of the flock, even of whatsoever path is under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. He shall not search out whether it be good or bad, neither shall he change it. And if he change it at all, then both it and the change thereof shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. So if you tithe something and then you redeem your tithe, you are to add the fifth part or 20% to that. But if you uh, commit or make a tithe to the Lord and then you change what you have as a tithing unto the Lord, you can't redeem that. You've already done that. You can't commit a tithing to, others, to the Lord and then come back and the Lord is going to teach us about doing that. There is a host of scripture on that. And then reconsider it. Oh, I, maybe I shouldn't have done that.
neither shall he change it. If he change it at all, then both it and the change shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. These are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel in Mount Sinai. That's a whole lot. So what does it mean? How do we apply the principles that are operating at work today? One of the ways that we need to look at this is what our culture has done to the laws in contrast to the laws of God. Vows that we make and commitments that we make first with Christ Jesus are made out of a heart that has the heart of God to begin with. Why? Because we are born again of the word of God and the spirit of God. And if we delight ourselves in the Lord, he will give us the desires of our heart. And we love Jesus. We love Jesus with all of our heart, with all of our minds, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength. And some of us want to give more to the Lord and make vows unto the Lord because we just love him and as an expression of our appreciation for what he has done for us. The apostle Paul gives us an illustration of that in the testimony of his own life, how he persecuted the church of God. But then he goes on to say how uh, after the Lord God revealed his son in him, how he labored more abundantly than the other apostles, not because he was greater, but because of the grace that was shown unto him. So the grace of God that is shown unto us, we in turn express our appreciation through the various gifts of the Holy Ghost that the Lord gives us, and then we vow, we commit that to the Lord throughout our lives. Some of us have the gift of knowledge, the academics among us. Some can sew. What do I mean? They make dresses. They make clothing. Some people are gardeners. Some people are attorneys. Some are doctors. Some, the Lord Jesus Christ has saved and set apart from them for himself, and he's placed them in government. Some are apostles, some are pastors, some are teachers, some are preachers, some are evangelists. Some have uh, the gift of tongues. There are so many gifts of the Holy Ghost, but that which we commit unto the Lord, he is able to keep that until the day of Christ. We live in a culture and a society that has no respect or regard for vows or commitments. And when you look at the word of God in contrast to our culture and society, that devalues any commitment to anything or anybody except to non-commitment. 
what does that look like? Well, let's look at the most obvious place where we see the breakdown and the devaluing of a vow, and that's in the home. The vast majority of homes are made up of one parent. Those that have two parents, over half of them are in non matrimonial relationships, meaning it could be the father and the mother in the home, but they're not married. So either one of them leave the door open to walk out at any given time. See, it's tough to keep a vow. And it's a vow that um, uh, we make before God and man. And the price of the redemption of the vow is so high that it's intended to discourage the person or persons from making the vow rashly. That you would not want to make one because the cost is so high. You can kid yourself and I could kid myself thinking that I can make this work without a vow in opposition to the word of God, in contradiction to the word of God, but it can't. See, because if that worked, what would be the need for the Lord Jesus Christ revealing the revelation and the nature of the vow? Now, within the framework of the home, now you have mothers who are not committed to their husbands. Husbands who are not committed to their wives. Parents who are not committed to their children. And look at the cost society is paying for rejecting the vow and look at what you're getting in exchange for the casual attitude Indeed, not even considering a commitment to a vow, first to God and then to our husband or the husband to the wife and then to the commitment to the family that comes out of the union of that man to his wife and that wife to her husband. Our culture has says you don't have to make a vow. You can make a, what they call, a commitment to your partner. And you can treat 
that relationship on your terms, how you define how that commitment should look or what the two of you will agree to. But by nature, we are sinners. So any commitment that you make, you are already negotiating from a position of self-interest, your own. And you and I are always, unless we have the heart and the mind of Christ, unless you and I are operating from the mind or the heart of Christ, I am going to treat every relationship from my own personal advantage. And you know it as well as I do that that is how you are treating that relationship with that woman, with that man that you are not married to, that you live in with for now. And how many does that make? Is this your second, third, hundredth? Or are you just getting started? See, because life is going to teach you some lessons. And, and see, what this culture has deceitfully sold to the masses is that it's eat, drink, or tomorrow we die on your terms. And it ignores that life is difficult. Stuff is going to be thrown at me and you and have been thrown at me and you, and you're going to get blindsided by some stuff. And it's going to call upon emotions and a mental steadfastness that pleasure can't give you because pleasure robs you of that. Self-interest robs you of that. And see, in order for you to keep the vow, it implies I'm going to be called upon to make known sacrifices as well as the unknown sacrifices. And am I still going to keep that vow when the unknown comes upon me and encroach upon that vow? See, that's why we need the Holy Ghost. See, the world and our culture is not telling you the truth. It's not teaching you that because what it what what you are and what it it's telling you is shallow there's no depth to it but when you make a vow and you have to wrestle with that child born with a disability when you have fully expected him or her to be normal if you will and there's an extra chromosome on the 21st or the second or the fourth. Born with a blood disorder. Prematurely developed childhood cancer. I'm telling you from experience. And have I not been rooted and grounded in the Lord Jesus Christ? I would have walked off. But see, he is able to keep that which is committed unto him until his day. And see, 
to use the expression Christ used, the Father from the foundation of the world called me to Christ. He gave me to Christ. So Christ keeps me. And so I live out for those unexpected life circumstances that bow to Christ by the spirit of Christ, not on my own strength. I don't have no strength, but the power of the Holy Ghost operating in and through me, now I can obey Christ and agree with him and make his job of keeping me so much simpler. And see, now I can deal with divorce. I can now deal with the various emotion and layers of pain that go with that. Being fired from my job that I need to support my family with. See, now I can deal with that. I'll wrestle with the various emotions that come with that and the feelings that come with that and, 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 and that heartache that come with that and the levels of joy when I see the liberty and the freedom of that. When I make that vow to Christ, to commit. You may have to be single. You may have been called to singleness. But see, now this world in our culture, in American society, sleep with anybody. They don't tell you the consequences. When you fornicate, that is, just simply sleeping around with anyone who asks or of your choosing. You, first of all, you sin against yourself. There is so much in, in, involved in the sexual activity that is designed and intended for marriage for you to appreciate marriage on a high plane and a high note that you and I rob ourselves of when we throw ourselves away to different ones. The culture isn't telling you that. The depth of who you are as a person, no one, no one knows that. Even those of us who are born again, filled with the spirit of God and have the wisdom of God. But I can tell you this, I know that it is much deeper than just sleeping with him and forget about him once you're done with him. Because it's not like that. It's not that easy, sister. And brother, when you go with her and you release yourself in her and you stay with her for a minute and then you go on to your next conquest, it's not that easy. You think it is. You've been brainwashed into believing that you can just have these relationships. And even if it's a long-term relationship that you never formalize with that one man if you are a, wo a, a woman and with that woman if you are a man 50, 60 years, you still 
rob yourself when you don't do it God's way, which is in marriage. The mental, the psychological derangement. Your perverted now understanding of what it means to be sexually intimate with your husband or with your wife, if you are a man with your wife, or if you are a woman with your husband. You have a perverted and a distorted understanding of the act itself, all the emotions and understanding and the wisdom in the act, and then the, that which springs out from it. And then you pick up behaviors that you don't understand about yourself that you never expected. And then your children, our children look to us to teach them what real commitment is and what a real vow is. And your covenant with your husband or with your wife is just that, a covenant. When you are operating from the position of being an enemy of God, then you come up with all of these crazy, insane substitutes. And you teach your children the very things that you are practicing. And what are you teaching them? It's how he or she defines life, which actually makes them and you gods. And so now on top of everything else, you're guilty of idolatry because you have rejected the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as Lord, what he has declared all men, sinners, and you are his enemy, and he's the only solution, you have said by action and deed that that's not true, that he's a liar and that you are a good person and you're not. There is none good at the heart of it, sweetheart. You are a sinner. And as a sinner, you crazy. As a sinner, you're going to think crazy. And what do I mean when I say that? You are an antagonist. You hate God. And you're going to say and do everything contrary to what is truly sound in mind and in spirit. So you out of your mind. As a sinner, you are out of your mind. You, regardless of whether you have a PhD or you are uh, Stephen Hawking or and sit in his chair or any other person's chair, or you occupy the White House or any other house, 
you're out of your mind. You don't think clearly. And your pride is going to turn me off and have tuned me out because you think otherwise. But before you finish, if you haven't already done, consider it. Those nasty, dirty, hateful thoughts. How do you explain those? How do you explain those little behaviors? How do you explain that you have a PhD yet you masturbate and or yet you sleeping with somebody else's husband or you having a relationship with a you a woman and you having a relationship with another woman? How do you explain that you are willing to deceive your customers and your clients? Put them in investments that you know are too risky for them. How do you explain why you are willing to make your colleagues look bad so that you can have their position? How do you explain that? The what, how do you explain why you're doing it? Is it sin? And the mystery of iniquity at work in you? Or is it left over from your alleged evolutionary transition from, from an animal? Ridiculous. You're far too deep. You're far too complex than that. One cell of your body is just too complicated and too complex for that as a reasonable explanation for your behavior and your thoughts that you think no one else knows. So our culture has and is selling you short when you embrace that you can live without restraint. Vows limit and places up boundaries that you can't cross. And so therefore, they are not encouraged outside of Christ. So the benefits of making a sound vow, a godly vow, goes beyond that vow, goes beyond that thing, that child, that job, the, that ministry that we vow unto God. It goes well beyond that. And so I want to pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I wanna pray for those who are still in their sins. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you right now to lead and to guide the sinner man to Christ Jesus, who is able to redeem and empower them with his spirit and that they might have life, the life that they are seeking, the life that they crave, and that you would fulfill them in you. And for my brothers and sisters in Christ who are enjoying that life that you have put barriers around through vows. And to remember that if there is any among us who calls himself a brother or a sister, who is a liar, who is a fornicator, who is out of order, 
to come from among them. And Father, encourage them that they might see that God has called us to holiness. And perhaps they might recover themselves, confess their sin, and walk in the power of the Holy Ghost. Father, thank you for that. May God bless you. May God keep you. And may God make his grace to shine upon you and keep you in perfect peace. And it's okay to make a vow to the Lord because he will enable you to keep that which is committed unto him. In Jesus' name, amen.